morning, Samuel. Good morning, Alice. You're all right. Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> I have had... A- that was a very uncertain I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> No, I've had um, a very intense week. Do you want, do you want, do you want the briefest oh of um, summaries of how my week's gone? You've had a hell of a week, but but feed it back to me. It's been an intense week. Well, in, in summary, I have just finished, uh, as, as the listeners know, I work in TV, and I've just finished a contract uh, for a TV show that I've done that was very, very intense, uh, to say the least. It was a short uh, run, but it was very intense. Um, in the same week, I had an appointment for a minor surgery I have coming up, which is all fine. Uh, but that's just on my plate as well. And then I also have just booked my next job, which is great and all, but uh, I, and I shan't give the exact location of my <laughs> to be address, but I will be taking a two month move away from London, which is my usual base, uh, to the southeast coast. Um, and, and I move yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> this we're recording yeah. this on Sunday and I literally by the time this comes out Sam will have Sam will be living in in a seaside town for a bit um so it's been a bit Bloody of an intense hell. week on my side <laughs> how about you a, just a little bit just a little just bit. a little bit just a bit I mean comparatively I'm fine I'm absolutely <laughs> fine yeah I'm great like I mean you know work is work and so on and so forth but nothing nothing crazy yeah no it's all fine for the for the dear listeners sam sam is fine mentally he's well surgeries will be sam fine. is fine um but yeah it's just was it was just like very a very low chance he dies <laughs> i'm not putting that into the universe um but if you've ever wanted to be a co-host start having a think about what that pitch might look like <laughs> start. start applications now oh my god if i died would you do would you carry on hulala with someone else? I don't think I could be bothered. Oh, fair. I don't think I could be bothered. <laughs> I'd say like, oh, it's too difficult for me to carry on in like an emotional sense. But in reality, it'd be I'm not organized enough to carry <laughs> on my own. So I do maybe like a last like, I will remember you <laughs> episode. Oh my and God. there'd be like a slideshow on the on the Instagram and then I'll leave it be. <laughs> that's fair. That's will fair. Will you remember me? <laughs> Oh, well, I uh, don't know how to carry on from that, to be quite honest. Well, on that note, happy Pride Month. <laughs> happy Pride Month. <laughs> well, I am very excited because uh, me and Alistair have been sort of having a chat about what we want to do this month. Obviously, last week we had the amazing Reese and Carrot on the podcast discussing Gallifrey Cabaret. If yes. you have missed that episode, oh my God. what are you doing? Go back and listen to it. They are incredible. Um, but we wanted to reach across all different types of what pride means to us. And this week, especially, I'm very excited to dive into why we are proud to be eternal stands of this episode. Yes. So, oh my God, I love the most tenuous link to pride for this one possible. (laughs) Yeah, this week we're going back to Fear Her, um, a very contested and poorly rated episode of Doctor Who from 2006 (laughs) from series two. And we haven't actually done a series two episode before i don't think no we've not i've been very excited i know obviously we went across all of series one so we're well versed with rose stories but um i think that rose and ten are one of my favorite doctor companion pairings and we've we've not yet looked at it so i'm very excited to dive into a series two the the only time we've ever actually touched on a rose ten relationship is as part of the christmas invasion which is funny Mm. um we kind of just it looks like we kind of tried to skip this era and we really didn't (laughs) i think we we kind of just we did so much chronological series one on episode by episode that when we got to series two we went nope and started to have a look at the rest of the universe so anyway we're back now back with a vengeance and uh yeah i really i don't understand i mean we'll dive into it but i do not understand the hate this episode gets like i've always I don't get it i've always loved it and i'm not like uh, we're very aware that there's often times that we're blinded by nostalgia and there may be episodes that aren't as amazing that we still love because we grew up with them this one however i i like have actual arguments in place as to why this is not a bad episode and it was truly panned when it came out i was re-watching it this morning a i was so excited to do this this one you know when i kind of pitched a couple that i pitched or suggested a couple <laughs> that i wanted to talk about pitched makes it sound like we have such a process for doing hula la and we sit around this like board meeting it was us two outside the cinema saying what do you want to do tomorrow and us was like i want to do fear her or love and monsters <laughs> yeah what do you want to do tomorrow morning so then after a successful bid <laughs> that'll become funny in a moment um uh i was re-watching it this morning and i was watching it with my sister you know we grew up with who together and she's staying over at the moment and we were just laughing all the way through it there's so many zingers in this um and 
it, it's just a funny episode. Like the writing in this, I really think is great. Like I think this is really strong, funny writing in this one. I think like the Rose 10 dynamic is kind of like at its strongest. The the comedy is really there. Um, there's some great characters like, um, you know, Maeve, the old lady and Kel, the man with the council van. Mm. Um, but anyway, we'll get into the context for this episode first. So this is Fear Her. It's a story that takes place during the 2012 Olympics. But in reality, this episode broadcast on the 24th of June 2006, which I'm disgusted to say is almost 17 years ago now. Oof. It is crazy. I remember this Ooh. episode coming out. I remember watching it like... I, we, I mean, we've spoken about it before. Doctor Who is something I've rewatched so much that I feel like it wasn't that long ago. But when I hear things like that and, you know, series one's nearly 20 years old, just... <laughs> <gasps> Horrifying. Horrifying. So the director of this episode was Euros Lin. He directed many, many episodes. He did mm-hmm. a couple in series one. I think he did The End of the World and The Unquiet Dead. And several in series two and series four plus pretty much the whole of Tortured Children of Earth. I think yeah. that's all of his Doctor Who credits so far. And the writer of this episode is Matthew Graham, who uh, hadn't done any Doctor Who up until this point. He is also the co-creator of Life on Mars and Ashes to Ashes, which mm. is one of my favorite ever series. Absolutely adore it. It's like a kind of like police drama come sci-fi, which is really interesting. Mm. Um, really, really recommend watching that if you haven't. It really holds up. It's very bingeable um, and just a very intriguing kind of like sci-fi mystery running all the way through it, which is really interesting um and then matthew also wrote um the almost people and the rebel flesh in series six six so that's all of his doctor who credits Hmm. now um this has a 5.9 out of 10 on imdb which i really think is bullshit i think grow up I am of the viewpoint that I think sometimes an episode just gets a rep as being a bad one and people love to just dunk on it. Mm. And they just jump to it as their easy example of a bad episode because I think, honestly, revisiting it, I don't think this is that poor. No, me neither. Not at all. So context for this, which I, I just think is so interesting. So this is set in the 2012 Olympics, but the episode was in production in 2005 Mm. so the bid had only very recently been awarded to the uk so the uk had been working on an olympic bid since 1997 i did a lot of research for this because i really wanted to understand how these timelines synced up (laughs) the the uk had been working on a bid to host the olympics since 1997 the logo used in this episode is actually the bid logo from uh, the noughties. And I didn't realise the UK actually applied three times unsuccessfully to host the Olympics. They wanted it for Birmingham in 92 and they wanted it for Manchester in 96 and 2000. And then apparently it became clear that London was probably the only UK city that would actually have a chance of winning the bid. So London, I don't know if you remember in school, I remember there was a poster in junior school actually, Mm. which was like, back the bid or something there were posters in my school about the bid really oh my god no because I, re- I remember like being in school at this time but i don't remember any kind of like propaganda <laughs> to try and get the london and the olympics no i that that's my only memory of it is there was one poster and it was like a gymnast doing a handstand on the london eye or something and it was like back the bid <laughs> and i guess it was like a national campaign to try and get people behind it mm. anyway london got awarded the bid on the 6th of july 2005 And production of series two of Doctor Who seemed to begin in August 2005, from what I can find. And That's so quick to have a whole episode about it. So quick. And really surprising as well, like the turnaround in terms of production. So production of series two started on the 1st of August. And I think that might include production of The Christmas Invasion. And the first episode Mm. of series two, uh, New Earth, uh, actually came out on the 15th of April 2006. So that's only what is that eight months between production beginning and the first episode airing like that's really quick i mean if you consider how long really really quick i like especially with the amount of cg that they have to like put into that i don't know how they did that so quickly yeah um i mean i think one of the things they're doing now deliberately is is taking a much longer pause between filming and airing doctor who which they're doing deliberately i think Mm. they said to give themselves more buffer time and that's why we're in this kind of limbo now waiting for the first series is i think when they're off they want to be kind of off and they want to keep regular who coming out. And I think Rusty Davies mentioned in the newest Doctor Who magazine that they're already, well, he's already thinking about episodes for the 2025 series of Doctor Who, which is wild. That's insane. Um, 
So in real life, the 2012 Olympic logo, the notorious <laughs> Lisa Simpson logo, uh, wasn't <laughs> revealed until June 2007, and the stadium design wasn't revealed until November 2007. So it'd still be another year until we even saw what that looked like. So obviously mm. in this episode, there's some approximations of what might that stuff look like, which is funny because obviously none of that stuff really aged very well. Um, now... Yeah. There's good reason for why they did this when they did it, and I think they would have actually liked to avoid some of these issues. The episode was actually lined up to be a series three episode, but there was a script by Stephen Fry that fell through, and this script was brought in as a hasty, low-budget replacement for that. So Matthew Graham said, the writer, in 2011, that they actually wanted to make the episode more aimed at children. That was the brief that he was given by... Uh, Rusty Davies rather than adults and the older fans because it was designed to kind of soften the darker finale that came right afterwards which is the two-parter where Rose gets trapped in a parallel world of spoilers and apparently Rusty Davies specifically asked Graham to write something for his seven-year-old son it it does lend itself then to having I would say maybe a little more of a tonal whiplash than <laughs> softening <laughs> the next part in that it's like yeah, we saved the day. And then it's like a storm's coming. And three seconds later, this is the story of how I died. No, that, that's the thing. Like, I remember watching it as a kid and thinking that, that I was like, you know, yay, haha, it's the ball bearings and they've saved the Olympics and hope and love and all that. There's a storm coming, Rose. This is the story of how I died. I was like, what's going on? Like, it was a yes. lot to like process when I was like, what, seven or something? Yes. So in terms of reception, in 2009, Doctor Who magazine did a reader poll to rank the first 200 Doctor Who stories. Fear Her ranked 192nd, which made it one of the lowest Oof. ranked stories of the 2005 revival. Well, it's one of the lowest ranked stories ever. Ever. And in another poll in 2014, Fear Her was the lowest ranked story of the revival. So it came 240th out of 241 stories. Oof. I don't Oof. understand it. There are so many worse episodes. I totally agree with you. So while they haven't dismissed the episode as outright being, you know, a bad one, David Tennant, Rusty Davies and Euros Lynn have all gone on the record at different points to say that they think the episode could have been better. And they said it was hurt by a lack of budget, that it was rushed, uh, filming schedules were difficult. And the mm. writer uh, said he received letters from children who said they really enjoyed the episode, but also discovered that adult fans did not enjoy it and had a poor reaction. So today... I think we are both <laughs> fear her defenders and <laughs> we kind of want to give like a bit of a positive angle to this. So for anyone who hasn't seen Fear Her, my advice as always is please just go and watch the damn episode. It's actually a good one. Don't listen to all the rubbish people are saying. It's a good one. Just please watch it. Uh, but for anyone who hasn't and would like a little bit of summary for the episode, here you go. This week, we're travelling back in time to the far future, aka 2012. The Doctor and Rose land in a suburban street in London to experience the 2012 Olympic Games, but they soon realise that something much more sinister is happening on the street. Children are going missing, and they realise it has something to do with a child called Chloe Webber. They learn that her body has been taken over by the Isolus, a young alien who is separated from her family and feels entirely alone. She was drawn to Chloe as she is a victim of abuse from her father, and because they both feel alone, it's as though they belong together. Despite a deep fear of her father, she still dreams about him, so Chloe drew him in the back of her wardrobe, and the energy in the drawing keeps his voice alive. In an attempt to feel less lonely, she traps children in her drawings, but the need for company grows, and she abducts an entire stadium of people, and soon is drawing the entire world. When he tries to stop her, Chloe draws the Doctor and the TARDIS, leaving Rose entirely alone to save the world. She finds the alien pod and the Isolus joins its family, leaving Chloe Webber alone again. When the abducted children come back to life, the drawing of her dad starts to manifest in reality, but with the strength she gets from her mum, they banish him back into the wardrobe and back into the drawing. The Doctor and Rose reunite, and as they walk back to the TARDIS, he warns her that a storm is coming. Oh, how mysterious an ending ooky spooky kooky and creepy so why don't you kick us off with with one of your highs from this episode well i mean again i don't even need to tell the audience here that we're both clearly stands of this episode i have so many highs this episode and the lows that i do have are just completely like explainable like it's not really a low it's like a, yeah i can see why people don't like this but and then why i think that they are objectively wrong <laughs> um objectively one of the highs that i have for this episode in general is i think it really truly 
displays what Doctor Who does best, which is striking a balance between fun, fear, and emotion. And I think that this episode, mm. especially in the opening scene, you really get a taste of what the episode's going to be. It's very like fun and like joyful. And you see the kids playing and the music's very light. And then ever so quickly, it turns to like a sour, somber tone when you pass the, ch- the missing children posters. And I think that you get lots of fun with Doctor and Rose in this story. And there's lots of like funny one-liners and them, play, you know, playing detective. Uh, but then you also get a lot of raw emotion, especially from Trish, I find. Like when she's talking about the abuse that her daughter's gone through, there's so many like, really like heart-wrenching lines. Like she says, uh, my baby, you'll never hurt her again. You're not alone. You'll never be alone again. Mm. And it's truly like, it, it's just so mad to me that those are in the same episode as like fingers on lips and, and the whole like ball bearing yeah. chat. And I think that it never feels forced. None of the emotion, none of the funny, none of the whatever feels forced. It all kind of like goes hand in hand together really well. And I understand the cheesy like complaints that this episode gets, but I just, I disagree. I think that it strikes such a perfect balance between all of those things. It, it's not even like a specific moment, just weave throughout the whole episode. I think it strikes the perfect balance between all of those things. I agree. It's it's cheesy, but it's also very endearing in the way the Doc 2 just about manages to to pull off. The comedy in this episode is, is really good. The performances from David Tennant and Billy Piper are very, very funny. Mm. And there's delivery of certain lines that just really gets me there's a lot of like good like glances and physical moments and just lines that they really really elevate in the way that they they deliver them but as you say the emotion is really there too i think this is the first time in the show that it's ever explored the topic of child abuse Mm. and there's something really nice about the doctor kind of saying like i'm help Um, you know can you help her yes I can and him being this figure who can help her family overcome that like history of abuse and overcome something really dark that's not an alien threat it's just something horrible and human that happened in their life is really lovely as well Mm. so it taps into some really cool psychological fears here as well like the mother lives in fear of her daughter but also kind of in fear of failing to protect and comfort the child and the doctor has to encourage her to sing to her and reminds her that she has a lot of power in that situation as well to help things that she thinks are beyond her control Mm. and chloe lives with this very dark fear of her abusive father who kind of lives at the back of the wardrobe and even though he's dead like his drawing can come back to life and shout at her and has also internalized the fear of this lost alien child that that can't find their family so there's a lot happening here that there I think, are like, layers you know, compressed into kind of there are layers in a 45 minute episode it, it, <laughs> it's it's I, I think it's great i think it's great too i really really do and off the back of that i think that yeah i completely agree that the doctor it's really nice not, not nice necessarily right but it's really important i think seeing them battle a non-alien enemy and it's just horrible things that this family have gone through but i also think that rose is so weighty in this episode even before the doctor's taken away and she has to do it by herself there's a really lovely scene lovely is the wrong word because it's all talking about abuse stuff but i think there's a really important scene where they first realize that the drawing is coming to life and they're now talking i think she's picking up all the pencils with the mum and she's talking to trish and she's asking her like did you and chloe really talk about your dad like in the abuse and his death like do you talk about it and trish goes oh i I didn't want to like it was too painful i didn't want to and she's saying to her like you know well maybe that's why chloe feels so alone because she has all of these feelings and all of this fear and she doesn't even think she can talk to her mum about it no wonder she feels alone and i think that Mm. there are silly little scenes here like the doctor to dipping his finger in the jam jar and stuff like that that makes you remember that he's an alien and yes he is there to help and i think that he is a real pillar of strength in this episode but rose as always throughout her whole tenure as the companion brings such humanity and real world experience and advice that i think grounds her and then later excuse me and then later when the doctor is taken away and she truly is alone she then also has to put on the doctor hat i think up until then she was kind of like passive is the wrong word because she wasn't passive but she was there with the doctor and the doctor was doing it and she was helping but as soon as he's taken away she works out you know the alien dad is just energy they can get rid of it they can will it she has to figure out where the isolus's ship is and i think then she really plays the duality of the role of the companion but also the role the doctor would play yes because i think as we do with a lot of companions we have her kind of following the doctor around she'll kind of almost like give out 
ideas or she'll say, look at that, you've missed something. Or she'll kind of be like, oh, could it be this? And he'll be like, ah, warmer, you know, kind of almost like, kind of like almost like mentoring yeah. companions sometimes into like, ah, you're getting it now. Yeah, that's right. Are you deducting? You know, like, oh, it's kind of, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like, oh, it's kind of, you know, metally, uh, you know, and then <laughs> it's nice when they're like, right, what would the doctor do? I like when they have that moment and then they kind of take on their own. You know, Clara's done that really well in the past. Yaz did it super well. Yeah. In the, um, Power of the Doctor. Power of the Doctor. I love when companions really step into that role of like, right, doctor's gone, time to step up. Alistair, go on, give me one of your highs. God, I've got several. Um, okay, one small one. Music, always strong. Um, I really yes. like this cue we get from Murray Gold, which is like, I don't know if there's a name for this. Um, you'll know what I mean when it's like, there's like a Murray Gold whistle. There's a sound mm-hmm. over like it's missing like, posters. Does that, does that help? Yeah. That hell, yeah. You know no, I, mean. I know, I know exactly the Murray Gold. It's that like, it's like, it's like rubbing your finger on a glass. You know, yes, it's like, yes, yes, yes. It's, it's like very that, that kind yes. of, it's that high pitch noise, and it, it kind of always like just plays on something's unsettling, something's <laughs> wrong. I love that cue so much. It is so nostalgic to this era. Mm. I don't know if it really came in any point after. Like, I really remember it strong in series one and two. I don't really know if they did it very much after that, but excellent sound very distinctive to this era i think it's a very series one and two thing like overall yeah it's kind of only really exists in uh in rose zero which is interesting but mm. i mean i love it and even the kind of sappier moments towards the end where the doc has to like pick up the olympic torch and run with it to save the day there's some mm. um, you know new music written for that which i don't think i've heard again or you know before and um it's you know it's I like the beat. (laughs) We love it. We love it. And I do think that the soundtrack is so, I mean, again, I know I've just mentioned it, but at the beginning when it's so jovial and happy and you're seeing, you know, the joy of the Olympics. And then again, you kind of get the Murray whistle when it then pans to the picture of the missing child that goes like, into like somber, scary music. I think, yeah, the music really tells the story in this episode. Another high, if I can slip one in, because that was quite a short one, Mm -hmm. would be um, great characters in this. Like one of the challenges for Doctor Who that is so difficult is you need to establish a setting, establish a threat, establish your characters and go through kind of all the stages of the story in the space of kind of what, 45 minutes, which is really, really challenging. And then, you know, give it a satisfying conclusion and tease kind of the next the next place they're going. Yeah. Um, So in that space, I think they throw in a few really great characters here. Maeve the old lady is mm. um is is an icon to me and i'm kind of astonished as well i had a look she hasn't appeared in any other doctor who media which amazes me that there's <laughs> never like a comic or a book reference because she has this kind of um psychic sense right that something's wrong she's like can't you feel it yeah and everyone's like no i can't feel it. they're not <laughs> safe they're not get them inside, get them inside. And- and so it's one of those things you know like every so often in doctor who you have like tim you know we discussed quite recently mm. or um there's like who's that? what's the name of that one gwendolyn from um the unquiet dead you have these characters who either like from birth or from you know where they've grown up they have like these kind of low level psychic abilities which is a very cool thing in the universe like that's yeah. quite common actually isn't it that you get these like semi-psychic characters yeah and um she just has some like great moments like just kind of warbling around on the street causing causing chaos you know just go, <laughs> who are you what do you want with I mean, our children when you compare her to like for example in i think it was series 12 the were like benny Where's my Benny? Benny! Like, when you compare those two characters, like, <laughs> leaps and bounds apart. Like, it's crazy. Leaps and bounds. Don't come for... Like, there's a lot of affection for... Uh, I don't even know. I, know. I know, obviously, I know Benny's name. What's her name? <laughs> there's a lot of affection for... Um, Benny! Well, I don't know her name. Where's my Benny? Did you hurt my Benny? <laughs> yeah, I know, maybe it's, I mean, not, it's them, not giving it. It's not giving it. No. And then obviously, I think strongest character in this mm-hmm. is Kel, the council worker. Mm-hmm. So Love Actually star Abdul Salas. Uh, what you just said, that slander, I want an apology off her. <laughs> and that whole like, that whole discussion again, you know, where like everyone's kicking off and everyone's getting angry. Feeling and guilty, are we? Lips. <laughs> yes. You know, she's basically accusing him of kind of like wandering around on the street and it kind of stops just short of accusing her of being racist. <laughs> and... Everything he says, you know, and Rose is like, oh, fresh tar. And he goes, uh, 
blended to a secret council recipe. I was going to say, I love, like, I mean, I love the whole council gag. Like, I love his whole character. I love the whole scene where Rose having to dig up the road. But it's the bit where he says about the secret council recipe and she realises the Isolus is buried under the tarmac and she goes into the van and he goes, oh, I don't keep it in the van. And I'm like, do you really think she's trying to, like, steal the council's secret recipe for tarmac? Like, it's, uh... it's so silly. There's a moment where she goes into the council van to steal the council axe mm. and he's like, put that back. And then he realises that'd be asking her to go back into the council van. He's like, no, wait, don't. Like, <laughs> he's, like, he's like losing himself on like the levels of council. He's he's so good. Such a funny character. There were so many great quotes from him that we'll definitely come back to you about uh, kind of, yeah, the council van and the council axe and the council road. But um that was definitely my favourite moment. I don't think he's done a whole ton of acting since this in Love Actually, but he does a lot of voice acting. I definitely recognise his voice on things. He does he does a lot of ads and things, I think. Uh, we put up a TikTok clip the other day. Someone did a sad <laughs> a sad edit with Elton John, Yellow Brick Road. This boy's too young to be singing. <laughs> and then it's slow-mo of <laughs> Rose being the villain, hopping into the back of his van, grabbing his axe and his like devastated face. And they've like made his voice echo like, no! <laughs> and she's smashing up his road and she has like a manic smile on her face it's so funny absolutely sent me the mania in her face it looks like she's truly just turned and like in a very hostile malicious way has decided to dig up this poor man's road um anyway that made me laugh that is funny well i mean the going on from making people laugh i think this episode has so again like, i've already spoken about how it balances the line of funny and scary and whatever but it has so many like zingers as well like we always love a quotable moment so many, so many zingers i love the one where the doctor's like i had a passing fancy and they didn't pass a stopped like i think that's really funny like that's really clever writing and um especially in an episode where a big argument against it is that it had simple writing i think that it does toe the line between like little things that the adults will enjoy, not necessarily like adult humor, just like funny, clever dialogue. Yeah. And then I think that Chloe Weber, as mentioned before, she is quite simple in the dialogue that she uses because she is possessed, but also in the fact that she's a child. And I think that it's a really interesting point that it was mainly written with children in mind because a lot of the perspective that we get is the dialogue from the Isolus, who is a child, and Chloe, who is obviously a child. Yeah. And for example, like when her dad's trying to break through the wardrobe, like, you know, child abuse and abuse in general is a very like hefty topic to deal with and doing it from the perspective of a child. Like all he says is, I'm coming to hurt you. I'm coming to get you. And mm. that's all we need to know because that's all she feels. And I'm sure that Trish has a lot more sort of complex stuff behind that. But from the perspective of the kid, yeah, that's all that she heard that's all she felt and that's all that's literally all the drawing can say because that's all she has in her head for her dad and i that's think that's all she understands exactly yeah. that's all she understands that was, that was much yeah. more articulated than i was saying it <laughs> and, and it's um, clear right yeah. that you get the cue as an adult watching it that the tish would have her own reasons for being frightened of him and there's obviously more layers of complexity and there's reasons why you know she was kind of relieved when he died and that she's still frightened of him even afterwards you know it that, all of that still makes sense to an adult but it's mm. like you say it's done the way that that makes sense from the child's perspective too and is is quite accessible i guess for a child watching which is what they wanted to do but even with that aside the actual emotions from the characters that you get and for how complex the story is it's so amazing like when when the doctor's taken away from rose it's one of the few times in the whole time that we see rose in the tardis that she gets properly angry and she goes up to the Isolus, like she's talking to the Isolus and she's like screaming, like, bring him back, bring him back right now. And then she has to catch herself because she realizes that both the Isolus and the body that it's in are just children. Yeah. And they can't yeah. help themselves. They're just doing what they think is best for, to survive. And then she has to kind of take a step back and deal with it. And I think that there are a lot of layers with having the alien inside the child and being able to communicate through the child that would resonate with children but also i think it's just clever writing yeah i agree i mean two things i'd love to jump in with here one is on as you said mm -hmm. the zingers after they've successfully calmed chloe down and the dad has stopped kind of like you know threatening to come out the wardrobe um tish does something like but he's dead and rose does a well he's got a very loud voice for a dead bloke <laughs> exactly. she just does that like slightly lispy billy piper husky thing in the way she delivers it wow it's got a very loud voice for a dead bloke i just i'm obsessed with the delivery of that <laughs> and second point emotion this is so interesting i agree i see this criticism i was looking like why do people really not like this episode and i was trying to like you know dig into it and really get it and um 
some people don't like, you know, resolving an episode with the power of emotion. Totally understand that. You might remember the episode with uh, James Corden, his second appearance, where he is converted into mm. a Cyberman and hearing the the sound of his baby crying uh, prevents him from being converted into a cyber controller and helps him break out of the suit with the power of love. And people don't love that kind of ending. I get that. But I think emotions yeah. do have power in the Doctor Who universe because villains in the Doctor Who world pride themselves on lacking it. And Cybermen say, you know, if emotions are so valuable and this kind of thing. And <laughs> I don't know what kind of voice that was. That wasn't a Cyberman. Um, <laughs> that was more um, Alan Rickman. The Alan Rickman Cyberman. <laughs> so Alan Rickman. <laughs> <laughs> you will be upgraded. Rain and it's not <laughs> just that like i really feel like the creature of the Os the isolus is really interesting as an alien and i think they do a fairly like good job of explaining how like the shared empathy the love like is what powers them through the universe and i think that's just really really interesting like to get onto like another high for me i suppose this is a real like a plus mm. monster of the week i love the idea that creatures like that can exist in the universe and found a little quote actually from a fan about this from another fellow fear her defender and they said um billions of incomprehensibly powerful beings swarming together through space capable of destruction yet only desiring family and love and using their vast powers to make whole worlds as simple toys just one reaches earth and it nearly destroys us just because it's lonely because alien does not mean aggressive or antagonistic it just means different mm. i think that's so interesting like four yeah. billion of these things one of them drops through space and lands you know not by its own fault on earth and just because it's lonely and confused and because it's a child and it's scared like it, it it it's threatening to like you know trap every single person just so it doesn't feel lonely anymore um i, I just think that's that's interesting no, it's, it's really nice you know villain of the week it's another one of those like doctor who gray area villains it's like you know the empty child you know the freaky gas mask child we talked about this before you know it's not a malicious enemy it doesn't mean to be um you know converting people it's it's just a scared child looking for its mum exactly and i think that that's a really interesting point because so many of the monsters of the week are one baddie that is coming to earth and trying to fill a personal vendetta or achieve like a certain goal but i think that we do get teased these sort of aliens throughout the time watching the show like the analogies like the isolus like so many other ones where they're just passive and powerful they they aren't malicious they're not bad they're just like you said they're different they're not of this world but in the same breath of that and again i think like i've kept hearkening on about in this episode i think that the duality of the funny and the scary this also exists in the same episode as the scribble monster you know <laughs> like it's so dark mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um there's a there's a brief conversation right after that uh, scribble creature is um analyzed in the tardis and the doctor's trying to convince rose to kind of be empathetic to chloe and it's like oh it's just it's just a child and and rose is like oh well, you you wouldn't know you don't get it you're you've never had kids and he goes i was a dad once and she goes what did you say and they never discuss it again. It's so... I, I was so glad they put it in because I, even as a kid, like, I was aware of who Susan was and that he had a granddaughter. And I remember being like, oh, they're going to talk about it. And they never do. Nope. <laughs> they never do again. <laughs> they don't. And I guess you could kind of explain that as maybe Rose is a bit too nervous. Or no, is not a topic to be pushed with the time war and the destruction of all those people. Yeah. So maybe she's like, okay, I'm going to leave that one. And maybe they discussed it in private. Yeah. But it is one that it's interesting that she's super intrigued and then they don't talk about it at all. Doesn't come back around. I do wish it had some kind of line at the end of the episode, like where she maybe tries to ask when he kind of like says, like, let's not talk about it. Like, I don't want to talk about it. Like shuts it down to show that like yeah. she isn't pushing it because she knows it's hard for him. But as an audience, we do get little teases of it even throughout uh, Russell's era in The Doctor's Daughter when the Doctor is walking with Donna and he says, Donna, I've had children before. And she says, you talk so much, but you never say anything. And I think that that's also yeah, a really yeah, interesting yeah. part of The Doctor because he, he doesn't shut up. He's talking all the time, but yeah. he isn't really saying anything of weight. And it's very, very rare that he lets a moment like that pass and it's only with someone that he's really comfortable with so i guess a potential 
low. Um, I think I excuse a lot of this because I honestly just think like a lot of 2006 Who Now, it's really difficult to look back and compare like what does what does high budget versus low budget Who even look like? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's all on a pretty like narrow scale. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I wonder like how could they have made this better i guess the olympic ceremony could have felt a little more authentic and i guess if it had been done later and as a series three thing maybe they would have had access to more kind of like real olympic designs or like clues for what the stadium was going to look like or Mm. like what the logos were going to be because they've just used the bid logo on the banner here and that kind of thing and maybe it would have felt a little bit more believable maybe they would have known like more information even about like what Stratford was going to look like when they'd finished generating it and that's could have been like explicitly where they said it was going to be set is like this is Stratford or Mm -hmm. I don't know and then it would have felt a bit more grounded um but the low I was getting to in a very roundabout way is um I guess there's a bit of a sappiness about kind of the the olympic spirit charging the pod i, I think it's still kind of sweet but um the point where <laughs> you can't say a low even when saying the low you're like you're defending i'm still i'm such a defender there's <laughs> <laughs> there's a point where <laughs> this is so ridiculous the the torchbearer of which there's only one the hugh davis commentary that's a high by the way yeah. the hugh davis commentary he goes we saw the runner get struck by lightning a little earlier and he seems to be struggling now. I'm thinking like, he got struck by lightning <laughs> and you're like, oh, I always he seems to that. be down. I was like, wait, are they talking about when the torch, like, when the ice was running and it kind of like flew up it? Because that was not lightning. Like That they, wasn't lightning. They're just flippantly so like, mentioning that he got hit by lightning. Off screen. I'm like, <laughs> oh, sorry, off screen. <laughs> your, your torch bearer was struck by lightning and you just let him carry on. Like that's a guaranteed like arrhythmia and he's just la 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 like also like the one guy is running like the entire thing like a marathon lap point being the the like he's on the floor and hugh davis is like it's it's become more than that now it's it's a beacon of hope you know this um olympic torch and that's a little cheesy yeah that's a little cheesy to me i was like why is this runner who has been struck by lightning still aiming for the empty stadium of abducted people i like this should be postponed we need to like yeah. we need to pause <laughs> we for need a, a day. formal investigation we, yeah. we need to like delay the opening by maybe just like 12 hours we should take a breather <laughs> and sit down with the torch somewhere because we're running to an empty stadium where people are vanishing even bob even bob is even bob <laughs> the emotion behind him when he was like not you too bob like- not you too bob <laughs> Uh, no, I agree. I think that this episode tends to lean on the cheesier side. And to be honest, like, to be quite honest, I just say, get over it, grow up. It's fine. It's Doctor Who, it's cheesy and it's whatever. Uh, but I did make some notes of, especially like dialogue wise, I think like you said, the whole theme of beacon of hope and love is quite cheesy. And I can see why people don't really vibe with that. Um, I think the whole, you need a hand to hold. And, and then Rose later going, who's going to hold his hand now? Like that, that oh, it no. does lean more on the cheesy, cringy side. Uh, and then, you know, the, the whole thing when the guy does, you know, collapse after being <laughs> struck by lightning off screen. Um, the doctor picking it up and like not one member of security jumping on him immediately or like <laughs> t- tranquilizing him or something. He, he just like runs to the top and everyone's cheering and he's like, whoa, like with the top, like that was all a little <laughs> bit like, okay, Everyone's just like, so pleased oh. that someone could run. Presumably this is also a version of Earth where only three people can run. And they're like, oh, thank God he can do it because our one runner has been struck by lightning. Exactly. <laughs> they're all looking at him and they're like, no, look at him go. He's a beacon of hope now. We can't stop that. You're the beacon of hope now. But um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe this is just me and my nostalgia. I'm a lot more willing to overlook it because Doctor Who in general is silly and it's a silly show. Funny. Guys, calm down. You're rating you're rating your silly show on the criteria of too silly. <laughs> exactly. And like, I think there's so much silly fun in this episode that like they add stuff into this episode that like has no reason at all to be there but i'm so happy it is so that's like i said before the bit where he like dips his finger in the jam but also like in the opening shot the tardis lands between two like skips oh yeah and, it, it, and he opens the door and it's trapped and he goes like 
Ah. Who did even mention that? That's like the biggest high of this one. Literally. The hardest lands facing the wrong way. Yeah. Ah. ah. There's so much funny stuff in this. Even like the posters on the wall made me laugh. Like he arrives and there's a Shane Ward poster on the wall. They thought Shane Ward would still be relevant in 2012. At this point, he's now a Cory actor. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's no way he was going to be this like global superstar after X Factor. And if Near I'm just, future, like, yeah. Shane Ward. That's I who know. we're hedging our bets well, on. Well, he'd literally just... I remember thinking that because he had just won the X Factor in 2005. So they obviously were like, okay, this is the most recent pop star that we can get licensing for because he's not that big yet. And he's going to be huge, baby. He's going to be huge. He, he was who they thought One Direction were going to be. I mean, look, if the brief was write an episode, base it around the 2012 Olympics, um, you know, you, you have to link that to yeah. the olympic spirit in some way that has to be a part of it you have to feature a few like key things you have to feature the torch you have to feature the stadium mm-hmm. you are doing that without knowing what those things are going to look like and then part of the brief as well is write this for kids and make it light like mm-hmm. it, it kind of does it like i don't know yeah. i just think yeah i really think that they had the brief and they met it i like this episode a lot and i yeah highs more than lows i think as well like if this was done on a shoestring budget in a rush like it it doesn't i don't think it shows too bad maybe i'm being super naive but there have been episodes of no. been running, yeah, about that were done that were done with more i do think that it was clearly a lower budget episode and it was one where they were saving money and saving locations because all of the locations are real places like it's a real street they're real bedrooms maybe they built a set for the interior of the bedroom i don't know but i think that they were wise and in instead of trying to do a big space spectacle on a low budget, they said, okay, well, we're going to set it in the real world and the threat is going to be drawings and the the big, big bad. We don't even see him. Like when the dad gets manifested in real life and, we, you know, he's coming to get Chloe, we never see him. We just see light and shadow. Like I think that they, with the budget they had, they did a really good story. Like I re- like, and really well done. I really do believe that. Alistair, are you ready to play another episode of Camp or Down? Yeah, baby! <laughs> Let's go! Yahoo! <laughs> Not only going in the mar. Wahoo! <laughs> Wahoo! Fingers on lips, camp or damp? Fingers on lips! Uh. Yeah, pretty camp. I think as well, the like, <sighs> s- everyone slowly and nervously putting their fingers on their lips. Very camp. And then also Maeve being like, may I? Before she takes her finger off her lips. <laughs> Yes, yes. Edible ball bearings, camp or damp? Um, yeah, pretty camp, pretty camp. I think it's like UK specific. Does anyone like overseas know what edible ball bearings are? Um, they were banned in the US for a long time. Mm. I have a fun fact about this. We'll we'll circle back to ball bearings. We'll circle back. (laughs) We'll circle back. Kookaburra gay your life must be. (laughs) Camp or damp? Kookaburra gay, your life must, must be. be. Um, I think pretty camp. I think the line gay, your life must be in a Doctor Who app <laughs> is, uh, yeah, it's pretty camp. I think so too. I think <laughs> all of these homophobes are suddenly saying they don't like Doctor Who because it's getting too queer. And I know, yes, that wasn't the intent of the song, but I mean, the song literally being chosen by Rusty Davies say, Kookaburra yes, gay, your life must be. Like, it's not the meaning of gay. We know, we know, we know. But still. It's still there. It's still there and it's, it's still on camp. paper. Um, and finally, Kel from the council, Camp or Demp? Oh my God, the best campers part of this. <laughs> you just took a council axe from a council van and now you're digging up a council road. I'm reporting you to the council. I'm reporting you to the council. <laughs> <laughs> He's so funny. Like it's, I genuinely, highlight the episode, highlight the episode. Highlight the episode, best part, easy. Every time I see that clip, I just want to screen record it and stick it on Twitter and you know what? I might. <laughs> you know what? You will. You know what? <laughs> might do it. <laughs> You're so random. Oh well, Alistair, have you got any fun facts for me to do with it? I've I've got a few. I was so curious. So as part of my um, you know, searching for kind of what happened in reality with the Olympics versus what happened in this episode, I did have to have a look because the doctor gives a clue to Rose at the end and says that or all I'll say is Papua New Guinea surprised everyone with a shot put. And mm. uh, unfortunately, Papua New Guinea didn't compete in the shot put at the 2012 Summer Olympics. So oh. that was that was a joke from the doctor. But they're time travellers. Surely they knew. I think he was I think he was playing her. She says, are you being serious? And he doesn't. And he goes, I don't know. You'll have to wait and see. And you know what? He was having her on. And then he said, a storm's coming. <laughs> 
Um, what were you going to say about ball bearings? Ball bearings in the US. Um, I don't know that these are declared edible. I think the UK is is quite special for having these. They've got a bad reputation in the US. In the early 1900s, <laughs> at that time, they may have used mercury in the colouring. Uh, oh, it's God. not. It's not anymore. Really pleased to say. Well, thank but God. The, the <laughs> FDA basically said that manufacturers have to put for decorative purposes only on the labels for those so i think i think in a way the fda is saying they don't consider them edible in the uk they are considered perfectly edible and fine and uh, you could argue that maybe the doctor had a little hand in that (laughs) you could i mean i'm not the biggest fan of ball bearings and any listeners who are international please can you this is the like secret call out that you have to start tweeting us like i want to know if you I've ever had ball bearings before or if you even know what they are because for me they're such a quintessential part of my childhood especially like having them on cupcakes like you I think it's psycho behavior to put ball bearings on a cake like a full cake it's the kind of thing you only have on a cupcake but I don't like them they're too, way too hard like they're too crunchy for like a cupcake I don't they're not my thing and to be quite honest I can kind of see why they get banned um but that's so interesting I didn't really realize just how so unique the UK it was they are so bad for your teeth, I think. Like, if you try and mm. chew a ball bearing, I've not had one for a long time, but it's like a... you got to really... Into one, You've got to really chow down on them, yeah. I'm not sure that's... I think they they feel like halfway to as hard as a tooth, so I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I have a couple of fun facts for you too, Alistair. Oh, go on. So after the Doctor took the Olympic torch, fans were actually petitioning for David Tennant to walk with the torch uh, in real life when the Olympics actually came round. And then uh, when 2012 rolled around, an actor that played the Doctor did end up walking with the torch. However, by that point, David Tennant had left the show and it was his successor, Matt Smith, who walked with the torch. Oh, so so did, uh, did David Tennant never run with the torch then? David Tennant never ran with a torch. He only in Doctor Who with the fake white one. It was the big gold real one. It was only Matt Smith. He he stole that dream. Well, you would have thought maybe because he was still such a you know national icon that he might have had a go anyway. But no, I thought so. Who else? I know that obviously it was a lot of like just regular people, but I can't try to remember what other celebrities ran with oh the torch. God. There were loads. Oh, we had. Um, oh. So we had Rupert Grint from Harry Potter ran with the torch, James McAvoy oh. ran with the torch, and also the Black Eyed Peas frontman Will I Am ran with the torch. Oh, why did Will I Am run with the torch? I wish I had an answer for you. Why? Why do we have Will I Am and not David Tennant? It's <laughs> a really weird choice. Um, and one final fun fact that I have for you is that the episode takes place in summer but it was actually filmed in January and there were concerns that the actor's breath was going to be shown on screen and that people wouldn't believe that it was summer so that's why they wrote in the subplot of it being cold and the doctor saying that there's a chill in the air and it's cold can't feel it's cold and it was purely a practical filming reason it was because it was cold and they needed some kind of excuse to like cover it so it actually had nothing to do with Chloe Webber or the Isolus it was purely because it was a, the wrong time of year. That's quite a good cover. I quite like that. I think it's an easy excuse. It's it's interesting as well. Like, I mean, if it was filmed in January, that means it came out five months after it was filmed. So that was a turnaround. I really, yeah, I'm so gagged because I remember like at the Christmas special, you, do you remember you would always have the coming up this season on Doctor Who and they'd show footage from the season, but it would almost always just be from the yeah. first like five episodes. And it's because they genuinely just like hadn't filmed them yet. It's bizarre, <laughs> isn't it? You know, promoting a series that isn't finished. Yeah, it's a really weird way of thinking about it now. I think now you, yeah. I mean, the the November specials were filmed in kind of summer last year now before The Power of the Doctor came out. Mm-hmm. And they're not being shown until November. No, I mean, you're you're a TV person. Is that like to do with just how heavy post-production is now and like the amount of stuff that has yeah, to be done? Yeah, it's a lot to do with visual effects and post-production because you could film a TV show. So filming a TV show can take, I mean, it depends on how long the series is. I imagine they were filming for the three specials for like 10 weeks, maybe. That's kind of like a standard filming for a TV series. And like maybe, maybe like eight to ten weeks and the post-production on something like that i mean like you've seen the footage of beat the meat like hyper realistic yeah, yeah cg animation of a character and i think that's why a lot of the cg was a bit touch and go in the earlier seasons because they didn't a have the technology that we have today but also the time to properly put into manufacturing and creating these creatures and um that's why i think the only real cg in this episode is the isolus creature and when that one shot of the little pod flying towards the the torch and you really can see it looks like what were those little magnets that we used to play with as kids where if you throw them together oh, they the go orbs. like 
The orbs? Yes, so I always thought it looked like a painted one of those. A memory's just been unlocked about the time that I wiped my man book. <laughs> I had the orbs and I was delighted to discover because you remember like well they still are i think a little bit but they were really strongly back then when well, macbook shelves were like really plastic they had little magnets like under the side of the screen and mm. in the kind of near the trackpad and yeah. i was delighted to discover that the orb would like snap on to those parts of <laughs> the laptop and right. this was probably around the same time this obviously came out actually and um i like was spinning this orb around because it was like snapped onto this part of my like basically where the where the hard drive is i was like it's magnetic <laughs> and i was like oh <laughs> that's strange like my laptop doesn't work anymore and it wouldn't boot and i oh basically wiped i wiped my hard drive <laughs> by spinning an orb on it i'm so serious i was literally i mean like i can i can see myself doing it now in my head i was like like moving it back and forth just enjoying do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. as you did with those toys like the feeling of the magnets and i was i was actively wiping my hard drive that's so funny oh my god <laughs> ridiculous you hear stories of people doing that like wiping their cards and stuff but like that's so funny that you did that oh my god a silly little boy silly to, you're a silly little sausage you are oh <laughs> bless you alistair overall did you enjoy this episode I really enjoyed this episode. I'm so glad we went back to this one. And I think at some point we're going to have to keep going back to these contentious episodes because we're ready to defend them. I know. And I fear Love and Monsters will be on the horizon. Love and Monsters is another one of them. I think there's a few more I'd like to go back to. I think It, it Takes You Away is a controversial one that I really enjoyed from mm. um, Jodie's era in Series 11. Plenty to enjoy there. And there are so many episodes we need to dive into. And, and, and listen, I want to hear from you. What episodes do you love that are otherwise widely disregarded as being outright terrible? Are you a stan or a defender of any Doctor episode? Please let us know on our Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, all of which are at Hulalapod. And as always, you can always go back to our YouTube channel and watch old episodes of the podcast also at Hulalapod. Until next time. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.